Hello and welcome back to the channel. The latest news is that Sinn Féin and the Republicans have won an historic election in Northern Ireland. Sinn Féin has become the largest party in the Assembly. And this poses quite a few interesting questions. Now Northern Ireland itself is a very interesting country to talk about. It's a very difficult country to understand, in my opinion. So I must say right up front, I am no expert on Northern Ireland. And I know there are people who follow this channel who know far more about Irish politics than I do. And if I've got anything that wrong, or if there's any further point that people think worth mentioning, then please do raise them, do put them in the comments below. I'd be interested to see those. So having professed my ignorance on Northern Ireland, I will also state that I am not coming at this from any political angle. I'm not favouring one side or another. My interest here in purely in terms of the negotiation. And Northern Ireland is a very interesting country to talk about when it comes to trying to negotiate any kind of political solution. So of course we have quite a significant change happening in Northern Ireland right now. And that means lots of negotiation. So this is what I want to talk about. So for anyone new to the channel, I am the collaborative negotiator. I am a professional negotiator of over 10 years of experience. And I like to talk about current events and to weave in negotiation principles and to what that means for anyone who has a negotiation mindset or perhaps would be involved in those issues, um, perhaps you know, attempting to negotiate a solution and so on. So let's talk about nationalism and the Republican movement in Northern Ireland very briefly. And in this context, there's a simple rule really, and it's like the first rule of Fight Club. You don't talk about nationalism in Northern Ireland. And this is perhaps a contradictory statement, so please do listen if you want to understand what I mean by this. Because of course, the likes of Sinn Féin want to unify Ireland, you might say. So surely that will be their first objective and that will be the thing that they will want to negotiate first. I would disagree. Because, and there's an important negotiation principle here. Negotiation principle is you must understand your objective, what you're negotiating for. What you don't want to do is negotiate something that actually doesn't support the objective. So arguably what I'm saying here is that by any kind of focus on nationalism, by focusing on referendums or border polls and so on, isn't actually achieving the goal of nationalism or unifying Ireland. To achieve that goal, they need to do something else. And this is very typical in negotiations. You don't always have to focus on the core subject matter. What you need to do is analyse what is important that gets you to your desired objective. That is what a negotiation is. Negotiation doesn't just get you an objective because you negotiated it. Negotiation is a process by which you achieve your goals or, some, or a whole host of sub-goals. So, let's talk about the goals that perhaps the Republicans in Northern Ireland should have in terms of, in order to achieve unification of Ireland, at their strategic goal. Well, the first priority I put here is good government. And that is, the Republican movement, for the first time ever, is now the dominant party in Northern Ireland politics. Along with that, comes a weight of responsibility. What I mean is they need to prove they are competent and that is easier said than done and this is a lot of the problem in, polit in politics. Many politicians are lazy or incompetent. They always want to take shortcuts and when you're trying to achieve a massive strategic objective like you know unifying a country or you know, two countries and nationalism and so on you can't take shortcuts. Uh, you can't be lazy. You have to go through certain methodical steps. And absolutely, one of the first priorities have got to be is you've got to demonstrate competence and capability. 
Let's look at a more recent example. Let's focus on the SNP and Scotland. When the SNP took control of Scotland, in terms of you know, government and assembly and so on, they didn't go for an immediate independent referendum. They spent several years laying the groundwork to try and demonstrate that they were competent at government, not just an opposition party. And then a few years down the line, they then talked about independent. But their mistake was that they didn't follow the Fight Club rules. They kept talking about it all the time. They didn't really focus properly on good government. Now, of course, they must be capable of good government, or certainly in the eyes of the Scottish people, because the Scottish people are still voting them in to run the country. Therefore, they must have demonstrated certain, you know, to them certain elements of competence and good government. So why did they lose the independent referendum originally? Well, that is because they went in too soon. They hadn't really established their credential. The other part of it was when they put together their sort of documentation, their offer or their strategy of what an independent Scotland would look like, it was riddled with holes. And it didn't really answer some pretty fundamental questions. How are you to achieve this and how are you to do so? you know, competently without causing chaos. And that is why, by and large, the Scottish people rejected the SNP. Not because they didn't think they couldn't govern, possibly not even because they didn't think that independence, you know, was necessarily a bad idea. But because the SNP hadn't demonstrated that they, they had the ability to transition Scotland um, away from the Union. And in view of everything that we have seen with Brexit, I would say that very much the evidence supports that argument that the Scottish people made the right decision at that time based on that thinking. And that one of the key drivers of the wide independent debate loss. However, things are looking very different now. The SNP has spent many years in government. They continue to be in government. And of course, there's a very significant contrast between the SNP government and the Westminster government. So perhaps if they rerun that independent referendum, there might be a different outcome. And the reason why I draw upon that example is because the Republican movement in Northern Ireland will most certainly have taken lessons from it. They would have noted those mistakes and they will be keen to avoid repeating them. And this is why it was quite striking in this particular election. They didn't talk about nationalism. They didn't talk about the Northern Ireland Protocol. They talked about cost of living crisis, housing, and other issues that mattered to the voter. Because at the end of the day, Northern Ireland voters, no matter what their political, ideological, religious allegiance, they're like any other voters. They have certain specific concerns, things that they want dealt with, and above all, what they want is a good government that will look after them, that will take care of their needs. So for the Republican movement taking over Northern Ireland, it absolutely has to be their top priority, that they have to demonstrate good government. Because if they can demonstrate good government consistently over a period of time, then they are that significant step closer towards unification of Ireland. The second step, or second priority, I would say, for them is alliances and especially with the way that the assembly uh, is constructed you do need alliances to get anything done and particularly in Northern Ireland where you have a lot of different interests who perhaps don't necessarily see eye to eye you don't necessarily align very well so alignment is crucial and the Republicans will want to build those alliances in order to also to de-escalate the situation. Northern Ireland is a history that contains quite a lot of violence and fairly recent history, not that long ago. And so crucial to preventing alliance, uh, sorry, preventing violence, is making sure that people feel part of the process. And none, nowhere, or perhaps very few places, are there more important, but this is more important than in Northern Ireland. This is the whole point of democracy. Democracy is there to allow people to settle their differences in non-violent ways. 
And one of the dangers for the Republican movement now is that if they get a little bit too, um, you know, victory, like shall we say, a little bit too, we're in charge and you know, how we say it goes now sort of thing, they risk entering into this trap of marginalising other people who support they need. And when people get marginalised, they turn to non-democratic means to express themselves. That could be violence, that could be protest, that could be sabotage, that could be union strikes, whatever it could be. So what is absolutely critical for the Republican movement now, I suspect, is that they need to build those alliances so whatever they do going forward, as many people as possible support it and can be seen to support it. And this is why alliances are so crucial in any kind of democratic system. It isn't just about securing votes in an assembly. It's about pulling people into your sphere of influence and making sure that they agree with your vision. And even if they don't fully agree with it, they know that they are meant to be on your side, not pushing back against you. So that is the second crucial thing that I think the Republicans really, in a negotiation sense, really need to tackle to enable them to go forward. And the third, and in this order too, probably, they need to capture moderate unionists. I'll let you into a little secret in democracy. It's not much of a secret, to be honest, which is the political parties that win are not, they don't win because they appeal to their core voters. They win because they appeal outside of the core vote. They grab those who would normally align with the opposition and make them believe that they are a better choice at that point in time. So the long term strategy for the Republicans has to be that they're able to engage with moderate unionists or people who will identify as you being unionist. And the outcome when it comes to the next election, presumably in four years time, whatever it may be, they want those unions to say, well, perhaps I don't fully agree with the nationalist or Republican movement, but they have done right by me. And it's an important thing to state that done right by me goes a long way in politics. And that is what the Republicans need to do. They don't need to do right by Republicans. They need to do right by unionists. Because if you have, if you want to unify Northern Ireland, you can't just only have Republicans or dedicated Republicans voting for it. You need other people to vote in support of that objective as well. And right now, those people can be undecided or perhaps even moderate unionists. So they need to be a core target for Republicans in terms of negotiation, in terms of persuading them to come to their side, because that is how you achieve the overall strategic objective. So that's the Republicans. What about the unionists? What is in store for them? Well, right now, I would argue they are in a difficult spot. This is because they have focus far too much on the Northern Ireland Protocol and too little on bread and butter politics and that has been commented on by the political uh, media. So they need to readjust their strategy and refocus. But they have two core problems. One is that the Northern Ireland Protocol is widely recognised as being economically beneficial to Northern Ireland and even the unionists know this. They know that in terms of economics and the you know, financial benefits to Northern Ireland, the protocol is a plus, it is not a negative. And that is why it has a lot of widespread support, even among other, especially under moderate unionists, who recognise the benefits that the protocol gives them. So their opposition to the protocol is not driven by economics, it is driven by ideological concerns particularly the divide between mainland Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So they have a political argument here 
that doesn't necessarily, at this point, trump the economic argument. And the election reflects that. The second problem that they have is that they've been very visibly betrayed by Boris Johnson. So there's not exactly any kind of secret here. Boris Johnson negotiated the Northern Ireland without any real, you know, that Northern Ireland protocol, without any real intent of, you know, keeping it or doing anything about it. And when it became politically inconvenient to try and fix his past mistakes, well, he just basically abandoned the unionist movement, left them to their own devices. He is very happy to procrastinate, not to actually solve the problem. So when it comes to trying to persuade your voter base that they need to oppose the protocol and side with the government that has betrayed you, that is a bit of a difficult sell. So right now, I think the unions are realising that they're on their own on this one. They cannot count on the British government to actually support them in their objectives. So they need to deal with the, you know, the status as it currently stands. And they kind of have a choice, really. You either cooperate or you sabotage, really. So they could cooperate. And in cooperating, what I mean by that is that they could recognise the economic argument of the protocol, but demand that their political concerns are addressed by the Republican sort of you know, assembly going forward, shall we say. And if I was the Republican movement, I would most certainly encourage a conversation along those lines. Be seen as you know, the side building the alliances, as I pointed out in the previous slide. So the unionists could do that. They could try and press their case by working within the democratic system to influence it and to make it ease their concerns. And they know that the overall strategy will, of course, be towards unification of Ireland, which they oppose. But if they make themselves a credible opposition that supports a good government, then perhaps the pendulum can swing back their way and they can become the dominant party again through cooperation. Uh, yeah, with a few underhand tricks here and there, as politics likes to do. Of course, I suspect this is quite likely, they're going to go the other way. They're going to, at every opportunity, seek to sabotage any kind of progress. And this is possibly a risky strategy. This could alienate the moderate unionists who want good governance above all, all other things. So they need to be very careful with this sabotage strategy. Maybe that is something to do later rather than now. But it's also, as I said before, Northern Ireland history is not necessarily a very peaceful one. And one of the big fears is that the strategy of sabotage could turn violent. It could be there to completely undermine the democratic process and thus to force Northern Ireland back into Great Britain uh, in order to quell civil unrest, shall we say. So that is a potential strategy that the unionists might pursue. Um, but say so it, it could work or it could further undermine mind them. So it's a very risky strategy and they'll have to think very carefully about what choice they make in terms of going forward. And of course, as always happened in British politics, we turn back to Boris Johnson. And it never ceases to amaze me just how often he escapes trouble, usually of his own making, by procrastinating it, by putting it off. He is the ultimate political escape artist. And it is quite possible that this election has just given him another get out of jail card. So it is ironic enough that perhaps Sinn Féin becoming the dominant party it has actually helped Boris Johnson. Now as I said before he betrayed the unions, he betrayed Northern Ireland, he doesn't care, it doesn't suit and when it doesn't suit his aims he'll drop them. So he has been maintaining this threat to trigger article 16 
purely for political benefit. And right now, that's a very difficult threat to make credible because I don't imagine that Sinn Féin or the Republicans really want him to do that. And they will no doubt make their opposition very clear. And if they are the dominant party in the Stormont Assembly, then this gives Johnson the excuse to drop that threat, to no longer need to use it, to no longer cause himself a headache that is called Northern Ireland. And so if I was the Republicans, I would play an interesting game with Boris Johnson. I would say, well, you know what? Accept the proposals made by the European Union to fix some of the issues with the protocol. And this can also be used to ease some of the concerns of the unionists. And they can say that they're trying to also, for the benefit of the unionists as well, um, push forward that strategy. And if they do that, they can then say to Boris Johnson, they can count on them not causing trouble, perhaps a little bit of political support to help bolster him. And I suspect Boris Johnson would be extremely tempted to take that because he can go two ways here. He can take that offer and he can get Liz Trust to go and agree uh, to the EU proposed solutions to the protocol. And thus that problem goes away and he can justify it to the Conservative Party by saying, well, the Republicans are in charge. This is, you know, ensuring peace in Northern Ireland, ensuring that, you know, things and I we negotiated it. And now look and be, lo and behold, it is working. He can make that case. On the other hand, if the Unionist continues to sabotage any kind of progress whatsoever, then that could also suit Johnson because then he can procrastinate. He can put off the problem for perhaps a couple more years. And at that point, it possibly won't even matter to him. One of the legacies of what Boris Johnson and Brexit has done, it has had quite significantly increased the prospects of Irish unification. So that is a legacy you know, for Boris Johnson. He was the Prime Minister that split the Union. And we're not even talking about Scotland. That's another case for another day. But the whole point is that while that may, strictly speaking, be Boris Johnson's legacy, it's going to take quite a few years to come about. And by then, he won't care. He would have retired. He'll be on a yacht or a Caribbean or in jail. So either way, he won't care. So, so it will be very much in his interest that either this issue goes away and that he accepts the EU proposals for the protocol or that he keeps it, defers it and by procrastinating and by saying, oh, they can't agree, you know, and they don't have good government and therefore, you know, nothing can be done. So this election result could very well have helped him, ironically enough. So what conclusion perhaps can we draw about the whole situation? in Northern Ireland and the election. And the first point I want to make is that, as I understand it, Northern Ireland is one of the hardest places to negotiate a political solution. There are a few places harder in the world. I mean, the Israeli and Palestinian conflict is an obvious example. Even the Ukrainian and Russian conflict is not as hard as Northern Ireland. Um, yes, there's a war going on, but actually, in negotiation terms, it's extremely simple. Northern Ireland is anything but simple. And it is extremely difficult to operate in that environment and to get a wide range of individuals and groups to be able to agree, to be able to reach alignment. And that has always been a problem for Northern Ireland. Um, it has been very hard for a number of reasons, which I won't go into to secure that kind of alignment. So no matter how good a negotiator you are, if you're working with parties that will not compromise, will not try and find solutions to problems, then it is very hard to operate successfully. And Northern Ireland traditionally has been one of those environments. So the next few years are going to be very interesting indeed. And it will demand very considerable skills and patience on the part of the Republican movement as well as the Unionists. They're going to have to find ways of cooperating and working together that possibly takes them well outside their comfort zone. They're going to have to look at 
solutions in a different way, particularly for the Republican movement, because what they will have to do is dampen down excessive conversation from their Republican supporters about unification. As I said, they need to stay focused on being a good government and building alliances. So they will need to get their core support to buy into the common strategy. At the same time, they're going to have to agree strategy and positions with the traditional opposition, which will not be easy for them if they require you know, quite considerable negotiation skills. And it'd be interesting to see how they do that. And of course, having spoken all about Northern Ireland in this video, from a base of not much knowledge, and the one thing I can definitely take away is that you should never assume anything when it comes to Northern Ireland. Never assume knowledge, never assume as an outsider that you understand the situation and you know what the solutions are. So for me, this video has very much been focused on the strategy and how the various parties might use those strategies to achieve their outcomes. What plays out in the end will take a few years and it will be very interesting to observe this. So I hope you found this video interesting and the insights at least helpful. I am sure there are plenty of people who know more than me who will comment and I very much welcome and look forward to seeing what they put down. If you enjoy this sort of content and the way I approach um, explaining negotiations and using political examples, then uh, yeah, please do like this video and please do subscribe to the channel. Thank you.